Hello, and welcome to Politics War Room with James Carville, and I'm Al Hunt. This week, our guests are the chairwoman of the Democratic Party of Virginia, Susan Swecker, and a Brookings Institute expert on elections, governance, and public management, Elaine K. Mark. Now, remember, we love taking your questions, so write into politicswarroom at gmail.com or send a tweet to at Politicon for next week's show. We're going to get to as many as we can, but don't forget to tell us where you're from. And please check out the links to our sponsors, Henson Shaving, Miracle Made, and Magic Spoon in the show notes. We thank you for supporting these sponsors. It really helps make this podcast happen. Please tell your friends about us and remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. James, NBC's Meet the Press with its new moderator, uh, Kristen Welker, interviewed Donald Trump, and it's generated a lot of heat and controversy. With some critics on the left saying Trump never should have been on that show, never should have been interviewed, others saying Welker did a bad job in holding him accountable. Uh, there are critical adjustments the press has to make in covering Trump, but this criticism is off the mark. Of course, you got to cover a man who has a 50% chance to be the next president. And by conventional standards, uh, I think that uh, Welker, who, who has the potential to be the best meet the press moderator since Tim Russert, I think she did a fine job trying to correct a number of Trump lies. The problem, however, is the conventional approach doesn't work It gets with Trump. It gets overwhelmed by a bully who is a pathological liar, will, will just keep repeating uh, his lies, and you can only get so far. And there's only so many times you can say, you know, let's move on. I think you have to try a number of things. One of the things I would suggest for those sorts of shows, and I'm talking about television interview shows, is that uh, y- you can't do seven or eight or ten subjects. You just can't do it because he'll lie about them all, and then you have to say move on, and you can't follow up. as I think you ought to limit it to three or four subjects. In this case, it would have been uh, Mar-a-Lago on January 6th. It would have been Ukraine, abortion, and maybe one other. And then I think what you have to do is what Tim, Tim Russert made a great use of visuals. He understood how visuals could be terribly important in an interview. And once Trump says something like Nancy Pelosi refused to send the National Guard up and I requested 10,000 troops, Trump said that. And Welker said, you know, there's no proof of that. If you put something up on the screen where there's conclusive proof that it was not um, – Pelosi or McConnell or anyone else, there's something called the Congressional Control Board, I think, that has the authority to call in the National Guard. And it was actually Pelosi and Schumer and others that once that insurrection began, asked the Pentagon to send in troops. Uh, And the Pentagon says there is no, no record of Trump ever asking. I think when you put that visual up, Trump's still not going to tell the truth, but I think it hits people harder uh, than the very good effort of Welker to just to say that's not true. And I think you could do it in other things. You could have done an abortion and the like. So I I think that, um, I think Kristen Welker did a pretty good job under very difficult circumstances, but in covering Trump, all the old rules have to go. You have to cover him, but all the old rules generally don't apply. Uh, and I think there we have to explore ways to, to cover him that holds him more accountable. So one of my rules try to teach people to write them down at one point, but in, in politics, and I think the same is true for journalism, your third shot is the kill shot, all right? You open salvo, it's always going to be answered. I mean, you've never lay a, levy a charge or you ask somebody a question and they say, well, I, I just don't have an answer for that. If, if any, if, however difficult or uncomfortable a question is, they will answer it. Then you're set up for the third shot. That's your kill shot. And that's exactly what you're saying. And you have to, and it's pretty easy to anticipate his answers. Sure is. Uh, and so you, 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 you dig through, you, you get the videos, you get everything, and so you just you lay out the question. Then he, of course, he's going to lie because he's never done anything but that. And then you say, well, let me get you to respond to this. Mm-hmm. And that's the only way. But just remember this. The, the third shot is the kill shot. You launch an attack, you know, you serve the ball, they're going to hit it back to you. Every time. 
now, where you you know how you position yourself. I'm not very much of a tennis expert, but if you get in the right place and you crush, you crush the third shot, and that's what happened here. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I thought she did fine. It was the first time. I, I, I would say I, I would call her performance you know, in, impressive, maybe. Yeah. But for I'd say for opening salvo, I would call her performance impressive. And I think she has a, a real good chance to get a lot better, which is, you know, be good. good. No, but, I agree <laughs> with you. And I do think, you know, as you say, to take the, you know, Trump saying that he, he were, you know, wanted to send in 10,000 National Guard, which is a total falsehood. Uh, you know, if she had put up on the screen, and I, I agree, I think she did a good job. You know, the Pentagon says there was no request. Well, Trump can come back and say the Pentagon's lying. That's fine. But I think some viewers out there would say, wait a minute. You know, I, I can't quite buy that. Is it a panacea? No, because nothing's a panacea with someone who has no regard for the truth and is a bully. But I think I think it would help uh, in those sorts of interviews. So if he does it in the future, don't try to ask him something he hadn't been asked before. Right. Ask him something that you know how he's going to answer. Of course, it's going to be a lie. And then you put it up. You don't... He, he lies about everything. You just got to make sure that you get him to lie about something you have the answer to. Yeah, and it's predictable. I mean, almost oh, everything he said last Sunday, uh, almost every lie he told, he had told before. And one thing that's not sufficient, NBC put out later a fact check uh, on its website. Well, I, I, you know, that's good. I'm glad they did that. But that, 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 that doesn't work. You have to do better than that. You have to do more of it in real time. You know, Albert, he famously said, I could shoot someone in the middle of Fifth Avenue and my people wouldn't care. Yeah, that's he true. He actually is an adjudicated rapist on Fifth Avenue and his people don't care. You understand that a judge found a court of law determined that in the common use of the word, he raped a woman on Fifth Avenue. I'm sorry, he just did. And yeah. that's not uh, my opinion. That's a, that's a, Court of competent jurisdiction making that determination. Yeah, okay. you, know, you know, James, maybe for a future show, we need to put together two or three smart people, Jim Fallow, Sarah Ellison, uh, you know, and, and maybe someone with a lot of experience in television to kind of talk through again uh, how you cover Trump. Because in all likelihood, I'm afraid, I didn't used to think so, I'm afraid this is going to be a 14-month proposition and it is challenging it's not easy yeah i mean i i don't you know i i, I honestly have some some sympathy because everybody struggles with this question and i i i i'd be i would be totally up to that you know you know i, I think fellows and, and sarah elson and you know one you know one more person would be really good because there is not a consensus. People get really mad about it. People have really strong feelings. And I, I, I'm not even sure myself. But it, it's clear then you, you ask him something, he don't give a fuck. I mean, give you any answer he wants. And he never tells the truth. Yeah. But catching him in a lie, I don't even know that, that they've caught him in 31,000 lies. Well, you're right, um, uh, and, and, uh, but I think that it is still, if you put something up on the screen, this is, I'm going back to Tim Russell. I don't uh, understand. I'm I, not. I, think, I think it has a better chance of making some day. I don't know that. We haven't really right. tried it with him, but I, I think it's worth trying. Right. I don't, I, I, I agree. Yeah. Uh, James, before we go to our great guest, um, the, 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 the House Republicans, God, you know, they're even more screwed up than I thought they were going to be. I mean, it, it is, you talk about a clown show. They are so unfit to govern and people say, well, you know, poor Kevin McCarthy, he's got all these different uh, uh, elements of his party. Well, you know, Pelosi had those elements of her party and uh, she handled it pretty damn well for uh, a number of years. I, 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 I think ultimately, whether it's September 30th or October 30th, they're going to be a, there's going to be a government shutdown because that's what most that's what a number of those people want. Well, okay, here we go. Uh, I don't think 
that they have any plan or idea. I think that Kevin McCarthy gets up one morning and his entire goal that day is to go to bed as Speaker of the House. Mm-hmm. I don't think they know, have any idea of what they're going to do on these impeachment hearings. I don't even think they can have any because they can't call any witnesses and they can't allow the Democrats to cross-examine anybody because they'll make a fool out of them. They have no idea where that's going. They don't even have any idea what's, you know, where the shunt the government down thing is going. None. Because they're just trying to stay alive day by day by day. And I would, and of course, Trump is urging chaos. So uh, this is a, a large point I, I really want to make. Generally, shutdowns hurt the Republicans. Mm-hmm. They instigate these things. To, you know, they go for a little while. The public gets pissed off. They come back to the table and they settle it. And it hurts them. I am afraid, and, and Trump is definitely pushing this. I'm afraid that voters will say Biden can't handle these crazy Republicans. Uh, yeah. That this is just more chaos. We have chaos at the southern border. We have chaos in the, you know, smash and grab. We have chaos here and there. And they, it just adds to it. So generally, I'm pretty comfortable that these shutdowns play our way. But this time, there's an element of worry here. And Trump is definitely behind all of this. He's calling them, urging them to do that. And then, of course, they're going to, uh, although it's totally a Republican thing, you can see them attacking the president for not being strong enough to, you know, take matters. You know, Trump will say, this would have never happened when I was in president. I could control these people, but anything like that. But that's my worry. That's my worry. It's a justifiable worry. It scares me, too. I mean, the one... I, Joe Biden just doesn't convey strength, and uh, that's a problem. But hopefully, his if you look at his accomplishments, he should get more credit for strength than he's given. And if he stays in, in the CBS poll, seventy-two percent thought that he was either physically or cognitively impaired to do the job of president. I don't know how you turn that around. I don't either. I I I I just don't. I, I I mean that's a very, very harsh and definitive judgment. It is. It is. I don't, I, I, I don't know how you turn that around either. Uh, I, 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 you know, I, I, every day I get, I, I don't know, I, get, I, I got a greater panic, a greater despair, or, or anything. And then, of course, we don't even, you know, you get put the third... You know, no labels on there. Cornell, Cornell West, West. going to get a lot of fucking yeah. votes, man. Oh. Yeah. All right. We'll think of something upbeat next week. Right now, I'm scratching. I have, And if I don't get the right kind of shave where you get rid of all that stubble, it actually bothers me. The whole day, I have pretty sensitive, dry skin, and a good shave is not just a good shave; it just affects the way I feel all day. That that that's what I'm saying. It's it, and it's part of my daily ritual. I, I love the satisfaction of a, a good close shave. Well, if that's the case, James, and you're trying to look and feel on top of your game, as you know, you need the best razor. Meet Henson Shaving. Henson Shaving is a family-owned aerospace parts manufacturer that has made parts for the International Space Station and Mars Rover, and now they're bringing precision engineering to your shaving experience. Now think of razor blades like diving boards. The longer the board, the more wobble. The more wobble, the more nicks, cuts, and scrapes. A bad shave isn't a blade problem. It's an extension problem, and you need ultimate precision. By using aerospace-grade CNC machines, Henson makes metal razors that extend just 0.0013 inches, which is less than the thickness of a human hair. And that means a secure and stable blade with a vibration-free shave. Now, we've been around a long time, and we have never had better shaves. Now, that's not all. Henson Shaving's 
razor has built-in channels to evacuate hair and cream to make clogs impossible. Now, seriously, Henson Shaving wants the best razor, not the best razor business. That means no plastic, no subscriptions, no proprietary blades, and no planned obsolescence. Plus, they're affordable. The Henson Razor works with standard dual-edge blades to give you that old-school shave with the benefits of a new-school tech. And it's only about $3 to $5 per year to replace the blades. We can all use that these days. Henson handles it all. The first shave makes you feel 20 years younger, and the design and durability is unmatched. So like James and me, it's a time to say no to subscriptions and yes to a razor that'll last you for a lifetime. Visit HensonShaving.com slash War Room to pick the razor for you and use code War Room and you'll get two years worth of blades free with your razor. Just make sure to add them to your cart. That's 100 free blades when you head to H-E-N-S-O-N S-H-A-V-I-N-G dot com slash war room and use the code war room. You also can find the link in our show notes. Hey, James, there are a few matters in politics more arcane than party rules and regulations and dates. There is no one, no one who understands them. And the Democratic Party, probably the Republican Party, too, as well as uh, Elaine K. Mark, Brookings Institution and Harvard. Uh, she's written, I think, what, four books, is it, Elaine, on, mm -hmm. on this? That's, That's right. remarkable. First, welcome. Thank Let's, you. If President Biden, as he gives all indications, stays in and is nominated, there's not a great deal to discuss. I don't think you can correct me if I'm wrong. But let me start with some hypotheticals, if that should change. Sure. What are the deadlines now for presidential candidates to get in and compete in the early important primaries? Well, most of those deadlines occur this fall before the end of the year. So there's a lot of deadlines in December. There's some deadlines in November, some even early as October. So if you would like to be on the ballot in some of these early states, you have to be basically getting on the ballot right now. And that's more or less the same for the Democrats and the Republicans. One thing that, uh, have, what's New Hampshire? I mean, I'm assuming that whatever the, the uh, party says, New Hampshire is going to hold its primary because it always does. I would guess it's going to be around the 23rd of January, whatever have you. What's the deadline for that? Um, they haven't set it yet because, you know, they don't set the date in New Hampshire until the very last minute because they right. want to make sure that they're first. Um, it has been as early as October. OK, sort of mid to late October. So my guess, my guess is it'll be mid to late October this year as well. You know this situation better than anyone. Do you have any doubt that New Hampshire will have a primary early? Well, it, see, it's definitely going to have a Republican primary. OK, right. there's no, no doubt in my mind. It's the Democratic Party that said they don't want New Hampshire first anymore. They want South Carolina first. So for the Democrats, what's going to happen is um, we may have who knows what Marianne Williamson will do. Who knows what Robert Kennedy will do? I can tell you with 99 percent certainty, Joe Biden will not file to be on the New Hampshire primary. And so on the Democratic side, the New Hampshire primary, at least this year um, or next year, will be something of a non-entity. Don't you assume there'll be a write-in for Joe Biden? Um, yeah, there might be a write-in for Joe Biden. But frankly, um, I don't think it'll be very well organized and I don't think he'll campaign for it because let's face it, this was his decision. This was his decision to put South Carolina first. Right. South Carolina is first because of Joe Biden and the Democratic Party's, um, you know, loyalty to their African-American base. And so, you know, why would Joe Biden want to go screwing that up when yeah. getting that base mad at him? You know, you're absolutely right. Uh, but South Carolina picked the last three Democratic nominees. Barack yep. Obama, Hillary Clinton, and Joe Biden, exactly where they were. So why put them first and have them lose all that power? Well, you know, that, that, was, a, that was a question of some debate, 
right, in the rules committee, right? And and I actually was with you, Al. I thought they were in a more powerful position being fourth of the early primaries as opposed to first. But again, this was very much Joe Biden's uh, decision. And I think there was a lot of symbolism there. He knows very well that he owed his election, his certainly his nomination to the, to the solid African-American vote that stood behind him. And he wanted to reward them by making them first. So uh, that's that's the reason that I think they're going to stay first. Elaine, one more question before turning it over to James. You just married one of the great members of Congress, Marilyn Steny Hoyer. Is it going to be Steny K. Mark? Or, uh, that sounds a lot better than Elaine Hoyer. <laughs> I think we'll both keep, uh, given how old we both are, we'll keep our own names rather than confuse everybody. <laughs> Novak used to tease me that my wife let me keep my maiden name, uh, so I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate that. James Carville. Oh, thank you, Lane. Uh, so if you remember, and I'm sure you do, in December of 91, the whole Clinton apparatus was holding its breath because there was a plane going to take Mario Cuomo from New York to Concord, New Hampshire, to file. And this was in November. Yeah. And famously, he decided not to, to, the, to the giant relief of, of everybody. Why, is, is New Hampshire changed? Was back then, was it much looser? And now they, they have more requirements? Because if he would have run, my sense was he's, he was going to be omnipresent in most all the states. So what's what's the question, James? Has has that? Why, if somebody did a, a in December of ninety one, Cuomo was about to right. file right. in New Hampshire. Yep, was, the plane was gassed up and ready to go, and at the last minute, he famously decided not to. It, what has changed? Why why was why was he able to do that in ninety one, but can't couldn't we couldn't have somebody in December of twenty twenty three? Oh, we could we could have somebody in December 2023. There's no, nothing prohibiting that. I mean, look, the only practical question is filing deadlines, right? The only practical question is how do you get your name on the ballot? Right. And, and you pretty much have to be on the ballot to win delegates, although there's probably ways you could do that. So sure, somebody could come in the race between now and the end of the year. There's absolutely nothing prohibiting them from doing it. And most of these filing deadlines are, um, you know, it's pretty easy. In some states, the Secretary of State just p puts you on the ballot if you're a nationally recognized candidate. Some places like New Hampshire, you pay a relatively small amount of money and you get on the ballot. You know, New Hampshire traditionally has like a hundred and 50 people on the ballot. Um, so there's nothing keeping anybody from getting into the race at this point. Uh, um, again, again, Democrats and Republicans. So, and Al, you, two of you have a better institutional memory than I did, but didn't, is it 76 that Jerry Brown got in late and started winning a bunch of primaries at the end of the cycle? Is, yes, am I remembering yeah. this right? Yep, he did. He got he got in late. Again, remember that the, the primary season starts at the end of January and goes till the middle of June. Right. So the so the filing deadlines, right, all start in basically the end of October and they go all the way into May. So, you know, you can you can get in these races late. Um, back when Jerry Brown got in, there were a lot of caucus states. There aren't very many caucus states left anymore. And so the caucus states, you didn't even have the issue of filing deadlines. You, you could just go and get in there. So it's a pretty fluid picture. And if memory serves me correct, uh, Elaine, Frank Church got in late that same uh, that same cycle and yeah, won a couple of primaries. Yeah, very well, but um, yeah. yeah, he did get in. So one more question before I go to Al. It, you know, we're, we're just making assumptions here. It, obviously, if the president was incapacitated on Labor Day, would that mean the vice presidential nominee would then become the, the presidential nominee of the Democratic Party? No. No. Okay. Please again. That's, this is the money question. Okay. T tell That's us how this works. Question, right. <laughs> tell us um, how this works. In, if the if the presidential candidate is incapacitated any time after the convention and all the way up to the meeting of the electoral 
college, which is usually mid-December. Um, the Democratic National Committee for the Democrats, the Republican National Committee for the Republicans will meet in special session and they will choose a new presidential nominee. <laughs> now, politics politics means that, you know, they might choose the vice president, right? I mean, right, she, okay. she has a lot of support, but, but that has to be signed, sealed, and delivered by the National Party. We do have one experience with that, which is in 1972, if you, you guys can remember this, in 1972, uh, Tom Eagleton resigned from the ticket after it, it, was, it was discovered that he'd been treated for mental health issues. Um, McGovern asked Sarge Shriver to go on as his VP um, candidate, but the Gene Westwood had to call into special session the full Democratic National Committee, and they had to formally vote to make Sarge Shriver the vice presidential candidate. So that would be, that would be the same thing too. And who, who knows what would happen? You know, who knows if, if the party would automatically go to Kamala or, um, if there would be sort of a wide open race and that people would be lobbying members of the Democratic National Committee. Thank you, Al. Elaine, your portfolio is, uh, is, is, is bigger than just rules. Let me ask you this. If you had a chance yet to look at how the various gerrymandering wars have settled out, whether one party has an advantage or not. In the Congress or in the in, in the in the Congress, well, or Congress or the state legislatures? Oh, uh, the, oh, yeah. I mean, there, there's wide consensus among political scientists that there's a bias in Congress, the Senate, and the Electoral College in favor of the Republican Party. And, and that's for two reasons. I mean, a lot of people, I think, overemphasize the importance of gerrymandering in this, but gerrymandering mm -hmm. does, does matter. But, but basically, it stems from a fundamental fact, which is that every state gets two senators, no matter how small they are, and every state gets one member of Congress, no matter how small they are. So you've got your Wyomings, that's the most extreme example. You've got your Wyomings with, with three electoral college votes, two senators, one member of Congress, and they've got about half the population in the whole state that uh, a California ca congressional district has. And that bias is repeated throughout all the small states, the western states, the rural states. And so Democrats are in this odd position where Democrats have to do really, really well in the popular vote in order to get across the threshold for the electoral college vote because the Republicans just start out with more. So that, that electoral college advantage persists. No, oh, yeah, it's a it's a big advantage. Look, it's why in our lifetimes, right, we've had two instances where the winner of the popular vote lost the electoral college. You have to ask yourself, why didn't that happen from 1876, which was really a kind of unusual situation because right. it was all the fallout from the Civil War, right? But between 1876 um, and you know 2000 with Al Gore, you you barely have that happening. You got to ask yourself why. Well, one of the reasons is that the population of the United States during most of the 20th century was pretty evenly dispersed over the states. I mean, you had your big states and your small states, but you didn't have these huge states like California that basically, you know, has the economy that makes it something like the seventh economy, largest economy in the entire world. That's how big it is. Um, you didn't have the, the concentration of population on the coasts that you have now. And what that means is that the electoral college advantage for rural states, which these days happen to be Republican states, it was, was magnified as we came into the 21st century. Let me ask you this. No labels. Uh, if yeah. they were to w run, would they have, and we don't know who the candidate would be, but, you know, assuming it would be someone fairly well known, any chance of winning the state? And is it clear who they would hurt the most and take votes from? Um, I'm pretty sure they would hurt Democrats the most. And mostly because, again, you're going back to that, you're going back to the Republican advantage. The Republicans start out with just a lot of electoral college votes, absolutely secure. So the Democrats have some 
they're secure, some big states like California, et cetera. But the Democrats have to fight like hell for Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, you know, about six or seven states. So if you have a candidate taking away votes from the Democrats, taking away votes, it's more likely they're going to take away from the Democrats and hurt the Democrats. Because remember, the Trump voters, they are intensely loyal. Right. And they yep. they just they just don't move. They're really, really loyal. Right. Right. James Carville. So, Elaine, Albert and I, the, the decision to bypass New Hampshire to a I couldn't imagine how Southern black if we recognize that in 1992. We actually got beat in New Hampshire by nine points if we just kind of pulled the fast one out. <laughs> but once we got Congress down south and the, 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 it was all over, it struck Al and I is that they were fixing a problem that wasn't a problem. And maybe one of the reasons is they thought New Hampshire was going to be a lot more quirky than South Carolina. When I say quirky, I mean would vote for, think of 1968. And well, they thought New Hampshire would have to be friendlier to challenge it in South Carolina. That, that supposition, but that's our supposition. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't really think so. I mean, I, you know, I've been on the Rules Committee for more than a quarter of a century now. And I'll tell you, the hostility to Iowa and New Hampshire has been there from other states for right. many, many years. They just do not understand why those two lily white states get all this attention. And there have been various attempts. You remember um, Michigan and Florida tried to get ahead of, of New Hampshire and, and the Rules Committee declared them illegal and wouldn't wouldn't give Hillary the delegates from there. I mean, there's a lot been a lot of attempts to take down New Hampshire. But all you have to understand about this is the following. Of all the presidents, presidents of the United States, not candidates, presidents, since 1972, every single one of them, with the sole exception of Joe Biden, has won either Iowa or New Hampshire or both. Which means that whatever party is in power, you've always had somebody in office who feels that they owe their road to that office to one of those two states or both of them. We didn't win either Iowa or New Hampshire. Like. Yeah, Clinton was we the other state. We didn't even compete in Iowa, and we lost New Hampshire in '92. Yeah, but come on, that. that but remember, Clinton was the winner of New Hampshire. I mean, Clinton was the okay, comeback right. kid. Clinton, that was Clinton. only because James Carville spun it that way, Wayne. <laughs> <Elaine. laughs> right. Spinning, and okay. remember what happens in New Hampshire. It's all about expectations. So when Paul Songus, who's the neighboring senator right. from next door, wins, everybody says ho hum, not a big deal. When Bill Clinton, who looked like he was a dead man walking, wins, it's a big deal. So he's the winner. He was but, the winner. And, and New Hampshire's a swing state. If Al Gore were to carry New Hampshire, he would have been president. That's right. And, That's right. I, I, and we have two Democratic senators, two yeah. Democratic Congress in Congress. And I, I, I thought, and I think Al Shands, I'm going to turn it right over to him, we've ran the danger of really pissing him off for not very much return. Yeah. Well, no, I elevate mean, that- a group that already been elevated. Okay, I'll- People were worried about that. There's no okay. doubt about it. That's the downside. The flip side of that is that you tr- anybody from now on who tries to put New Hampshire ahead of South Carolina is going to find that as they move through the primary season, the African-American community is not going to be very pleased with them. And so this this is this is the way that politics played out. It, it you know, right. and, and there's a danger to it, but that's the way it played out. I understand? Yeah, I, Elaine, I think you're absolutely right. I don't think it's. I, I think you're right. I don't think that fear is correct. I think, as I say, South Carolina was the kingmaker uh, in the last three yeah. nominees, but uh, it'll certainly be played that way. It seems to me it was done for one reason: Joe Biden. Joe Biden thought he could lose New Hampshire, but he would never lose South Carolina. And no, I don't. I don't think it was. I don't think he. I mean, remember, we're talking about a primary, right? right. Um, I don't think he thought he was going to lose the primary in New Hampshire. I mean, nobody was running against him. Nobody was on, you know, out there running against him. I think this was much more in the nature of the African American community is the reason I'm here, 
and therefore I'm going to reward them by putting th- that putting yeah. South Carolina first. I think that's more of it. I, I, you know, it's hard to say that he thought he was going to lose it when there was nobody running against him, and still he has very weak opposition. Yeah, still it's not. Elaine K. Mark, you've been a terrific guest. We have, uh, we now understand things that we didn't understand before. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, it may not, some of these rules and deadlines may not matter, but they may. Who knows? Uh, and please give our fondest wishes to the little man, Congressman Steny Hoyer. <laughs> I certainly will. <laughs> Tell him I hope we'll see you guys at Jerry's. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Nice to talk to both of you. Take care. Take care. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elaine. It was very right. illuminating. And we finally got somebody that knew what they were talking about on this topic. Because frankly, <laughs> I bet you, I don't know who does. Because we don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How I feel in the day is directly relatable to how I sleep at night. And I love cool sheets. I mean, I, 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 I'm so addicted to it. I can, I don't know, times when I was a kid, I would like turn the pillow over every five minutes so, so, so it'd be cool. And you're right, in the kind of humidity I grew up in, particularly this past summer, just freaking brutal, but I've, my sense is it's brutal. Summers are just going to be something we're going to be dealing with for the rest of our lives. And you you need that nighttime advantage in Barty's Cool Sheets. They give it to you. I mean, they produce real results. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Something you might not know is that the traditional bed sheets can harbor more bacteria than a toilet seat. It can lead to acne allergies and stuffy noses. And it's just gross. Miracle Made offers a whole line of self-cleaning, eco-friendly bedding, such as sheets, pillowcases, and comforters that prevent 99% of bacteria and require three times less laundry. That's because they use silver-infused fabrics inspired by NASA, making Miracle Made sheets thermoregulating with a design to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long. Just imagine getting better sleep every night. That silver infusion prevents up to 99.7% of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresh three times longer than other sheets. Trust us, with no more gross odors, life is a whole lot easier on your spouse. Even better, Miracle Sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands. They feel as nice or even nicer than bed sheets used by some five-star hotels. You'll feel like you're on vacation every time you get into bed. So stop sleeping rough, hot, and smelly. Get rid of those scratchy bacteria hosting pore cloggers and sleep clean, cool, and comfortable with Miracle. Go to trymiracle.com slash warroom to try Miracle Made Sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo code warroom at checkout, you'll get three free towels and an extra 20%. Now, Miracle is so confident in their product, it's back with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash warroom and use the code warroom to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40%. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash warroom to treat yourself. Thank you, Miracle Made, for sponsoring this episode. And look for the link in our show notes. Hey, James, our guest is Susan Swecker. I, I would say a co-captain of the best Democratic Party chair in America, along with our friend Ben Wickler of Wisconsin. Uh, Susan, we appreciate you being with us. Boy, you have you, you have the most pressure of any state chair this November, though. You have all your legislative seats up. Uh, you, you're both or I guess you have a majority of two in the Senate. You're down three in the House and everything is up. The Glenn Youngkin, the governor with deep pockets, is raising a fortune for his candidates. That's pretty tough to overcome, isn't it? Well, you know, Al, um, I would say, yes, I've got a really we've got a really big challenge, but I've never had an easy year since I've been party chair. And um, 
the one thing I have found is that Virginia Democrats um, understand what is at stake and we're ready to meet meet that challenge. So while the money out given is is daunting, the fact that Glenn Youngkin is raising money for whatever he's raising it for, whether it's for 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue aspirations, which he made, um, you know, knowing on day one he was more interested in that and being governor of Virginia or for taking back um, the the House, I mean, keeping the House and taking back the Senate. Uh, but the one thing we have that I feel so confident about is that the issues are on our side. Um, we're, we're not a, you know, there's not a Republican Party left in Virginia. It's the MAGA Party. Right. And we're the party of, you know, moving Virginia forward. And if we want to make sure that we don't have an abortion ban like all the other southern states, uh, we have got to make sure that Democratic brick blue law stands in the Senate and we take back the House. Susan, um, Youngkin has tried to neutralize that by coming out for, I guess, a f- ban uh, after 15 weeks with the exceptions for rape, incest, and the life of the mother. Uh, is that going to work? Can he neutralize the issue, which has helped Democrats so much? Well, I just would like to remind everybody that he is on record saying that he would happily and gleefully sign any abortion ban that comes uh, before his uh, before his desk. And there have been uh, pe- members in the past, Republican members, and there are others running for office that say they're going to put a total abortion ban bill before us. So I think he's, he, you know, he is, I'll give his political team um, a lot of credit. You know, they, they tamp dance around a lot of stuff and they try to have it both ways on a lot of things. But we, he's on record uh, saying he would happily and gleefully sign any abortion ban that comes on his desk. So I think voters, uh, you know, there's a little buyer's remorse uh, over the last two years, and I don't think uh, the women of Virginia are going to be fooled, suburban women are going to be fooled again. Mm-hmm. You know, in hand-to-hand combat, every seat counts, and one of your legislative candidates, uh, Susanna Gibson, was uh, it was revealed, was raising campaign funds by performing sex acts with her husband on a supposedly private channel. Um, nothing illegal about that, but it, but, it, but it probably isn't a political plus, I would think. Do you think she still has a chance to win? You know, um, I, I thought I, I, <laughs> I thought I had uh, seen everything in politics yeah. as yeah, Virginia me too. <laughs> party chair. I mean, listen, I, like we went through the whole blackface thing in 2019 and won the trifecta, right? right. So uh, in, in, to be totally upfront and honest, I don't know. But, you know, <laughs> she's the nominee. And, um, you know, we've got um, a, a, a candidate for the House of Delegates on the Republican side and in the the the, the the divorce papers is accused by his wife, Tom Garrett, of, you know, threatening to choke her and beating her up. Have another candidate for the House running, uh, in Matt Ferris, uh, you know, who ran over a woman that I, <laughs> I'm not sure what was going on there. Uh, so I, you know, again, we, you know, Donald Trump changed the dynamics on all of, all of this stuff. So, uh, the one thing I do know is that Susanna Gibson, uh, will stand firm on a woman's right to choose. And her opponent will not. You think that Glenn Youngkin's team put this story out? I really don't know. I really don't know. James, we've agreed that um, that whatever one thinks that sex is preferable to uh, beating up people or assault and battery. So uh, <laughs> take over. <laughs> <laughs> so just for our listeners, uh, Susan, I go back to 1982, the Dick Davis for Senate campaign. And uh so, <clears throat> I think Mark Shields was involved in that too, James. I uh, thought Peter was. Oh, Peter Hart. Hart. I'm sorry, Peter, Peter Hart. Hart right. mostly, yeah. um, so, the I remember during the campaign of uh, when Youngkin was running, there's this great tape of him. I can't talk about abortion now, but when I get in, I'm going to do. And of course, he got in, but he he didn't have control of the legislature. I mm-hmm. think there's a good case to be made to show that tape, and he's getting ready to fulfill his promise. If you vote for his people, he's already told you what he's going to do. Mm-hmm. And I, I thought that was a particularly damning tape that, you know, one of our trackers got him. But I, I think mm-hmm. it's probably time to dust that thing off and see if it has some current use. 
I think I think you're right, and um, I, I do think James. At that point in time, we'd said that, that Roe v. Wade was at risk so many times. Uh, the people weren't believing us, and so you know now you better believe us because if we don't hold that that brick blue wall in the Senate and pick up in the House, we are going to be like every other Southern state, and which will not only uh, ban abortion. But look, they're going to roll back gun safety laws that the Democratic trifecta passed. They're going to roll back all the voting, uh, making voting more easier and accessible. Um, and they've already, you know, Glenn Youngkin has made it very clear where he stands on the issues of climate change by taking us out of the, out of Reggie, uh, you know, which is, was a very successful program. So you're exactly right. I think that this time voters will pay attention to what's at stake because we're seeing it happen all across the country. So let's take the House first. What is the current party alignment in the House and how many seats are we targeting? How many of we can reasonably have to defend to have a chance to pick up? So the House is 52-48. We're in the minority. So it's it's very close. The difference between this year, that is a little bit of a... you know, learning curve for both parties is these are new lines. This is the redistricting cycle, and these are new lines. So in some places, um, you know, voters uh, are being re- uh, introduced to new candidates. Um, but also, uh, we, we have probably somewhere between 8 to 12 House seats that uh, we, are, we are targeting at, at different levels and monitoring, and you know how that all goes. I mean, tar- target is a uh, very flexible term. And then in the Senate, uh, it's a, uh, we have a, it's 22-18, uh, with the Lieutenant Governor being a Republican, uh, and we have, we're looking at uh, probably seven, seven seats there, seven key races. It, it, is there overlap? It, it, I'm trying yes. to do this. So, if a listener of here wanted to send a check where should they send a check where it would do the maximum amount of good thank you for asking that question because um we have banded together and created meaning the democratic party of virginia the house and senate democratic caucus and our the partners that we can um are align align with uh the outside groups which in virginia I know that this is foreign to a lot of states and a lot of uh, donors, but we can coordinate with outside groups in a non-federal year. Uh, so, so folks aren't used to that unless you're involved in Virginia politics. But you sh- um, we have created something called the Majority Project, which um, is run through the party, uh, and we're responsible. We've already got over 80 uh, staffers in the field on these races. And like you said, there is overlap on a lot of them working together. We run the voter protection program. We run the senior comms program. Uh, Jesse Ferguson, who's a well-known entity, Virginia Navy, um, uh, also a Hillary Clinton alum, very well regarded. I know you all know him well, has come in to help us uh, with our communication strategy. And so that's what we are funding and would appreciate um any, any, you can direct um, your your donations to that if you would like, and we would appreciate it to va democrats dot org slash majority, va democrats dot org slash majority. And one more quick one before I turn it back out. We have a lot of people that like to volunteer for different things. If someone wanted to volunteer between nine election day, where should they report to? Should they report to the Fairfax County Democratic Party out of Fredericksburg, but whatever. To give, give people, if they yeah. want to help, how, how can it, where, where can it pitch you? Well, and thank you for saying that, too, because that's just as important. If you could just email us at political at vademocrats.org, uh, we have uh, all kinds of needs for texting, phoning, voter protection, uh, door to door, uh, we will get you squared away uh, in a in a race, and uh, put you, and we would appreciate that. Political at va democrats dot org. I knew you would, but you got your shit together, girl. Go ahead, Al. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, a little more on Yunkin. Um, 
His supporters claim he appeals to those suburban voters as well as the MAGA voters. He can he has that uh, kind of um, um, diverse appeal. Uh, talk about that. Um, well, as I said, as I've been traveling the or mentioned earlier, but I've been traveling the Commonwealth um, uh, in every nook and cranny uh, this cycle. And I believe there is a lot of buyer's remorse. I mean, he, again, presented himself as a. Uh, very affable, uh, basketball playing, vest wearing, suburban dad. And look, we didn't, and I, and I, and I get the fact that, you know, a lot of the voters that voted Democratic were, it was an anti Trump vote. I mean, you, you know, during that period. And I think there was a lot of, okay, Trump's gone and he doesn't look too threatening. But we are seeing, um, people, uh, women particularly and others, you know, that feel, uh, deceived by uh, that uh, visual of him versus the, um, you know, the the shout and the alliance with the mega Republicans. Again, if you truly are not aligned with MAGA, then why are you saying you will happily and gleefully sign any abortion ban? Why did you not tell the mega Republicans in the General Assembly to stand down on all of the bills they put in to try to repeal, making voting easier or more accessible. He has not done one thing to calm that section, which is most of his party right now, down. And he's tried to have it both ways. And look, I think the Virginia voters are smart. You know, a lot of them are tuned into the federal stuff and what's going on. James is, you know, has a home in Virginia and, you know, worked in Virginia and he's followed it forever. And I know you have too. Like I have faith in the voters and it's like, you know, I just don't think they'll be fooled again. Susan, I was actually born in Virginia, uh, although although my, my parents took me out to become a Yankee when I was pretty young. <laughs> Oh, well, we'll, we'll born, take you back in the Commonwealth. I was back. born in a little town <laughs> called Orange, and I love, uh, so I love, uh, uh, I love Virginia. Right. Um, I, I, you know, what I know about Yunkin, I think he's very duplicitous. Uh, mm-hmm. And, um, uh, you know, I think we need to keep in mind, and you know better than I, that, yeah, he won in 21. That was before Dobbs. Uh, abortion mm-hmm. wasn't nearly the issue in 21 that it mm-hmm. became six months later. Would you agree? Mm-hmm. You know, I would agree, and that's what I am seeing in these. And again, some of my stuff is just anecdotal. I'm not a, a, a smart analyst like you all are, or a statistician or anything. But I am out there, and I, you know, I think after Trump, we beat Trump. Everybody was tired, and they kind of wanted to have a break. And you know, it's you know, with elections every year. But the crowds that we are seeing at our events, I was, I'm I'm up here in Alexandria right now. We had an event up here last night. And I know that's a very democratic area, but you know, it has been consistently great turnouts for canvas launches, fundraisers, whatever. And people are, um, you know, seem to understand what the, the stakes are and the risk are. And I just think I've not seen that, like, kind of energy since probably 19. Well, 22, but we were in COVID. So how does how do you know? I mean, it was a different kind of energy. Yeah. Susan, last weekend, November 4th, 5th, uh, you want Joe Biden and Kamala Harris in barnstorming for your candidates? Uh, look, we're not going to run away from from the president, the vice president, you know, I, I just think it's pretty rich how um, all these mega Republicans, once again, who voted against the American Rescue Plan and the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, are happy to stand up there and take credit for, you know, bringing broadband all over Virginia and other great things that, that these programs did to, to, to help middle class families. Um, so we're not going to run away from from any from uh, our president and vice president, but we are going to be very strategic. We are going to be very intentional. Again, we don't have the funds they have, but we have great candidates and a great record of accomplishment. Whether it's what Democrats in the General Assembly have been able to pass or make sure it didn't get passed. Or the successes of uh, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, and the, and the Democrats in Congress. James, is there any indication that Trump is thinking about coming in the Commonwealth, or people are wanting him to? Or have you heard anything from the Republican side on that issue? 
I, I have not heard anything. Uh, I, I think uh, Ron DeSantis was in without wearing his white boots, which still oh God, can I, pay I a like stick? really have wanted a pair of white boots, and now it's like ruined it for me, you know. Uh, but um, <laughs> but uh, but but I'm sure there are folks that would love to have him come in. And you know what, Glenn Youkin, why don't you just invite him in? Why don't you just go ahead? And invite him in instead of skirting around and kind of just trying to date him. Why don't you just go ahead and y'all just like call it, you know, official. Well, uh, I, I, I can't tell you how much I'm delighted to be were to have you on the program. I think this is a, Albert and I both shared, he's a pretty critical elections coming up. Very critical, very important. And, and we're glad that we can lend some voice to him. Albert, do you have anything? No, I, I just agree. Question. I think, uh, yeah, there are a couple of uh, good materials, particularly Kentucky and Mississippi, that are important. But boy, that those those Virginia legislative races are as important as anything. Right. It, it will determine Glenn Youngkin's future. And for those of us who have serious doubts about Mr. Youngkin, Susan, go win them, will you? Mm-hmm. Well, can I, can I just say one thing to wrap up real quick? Because I think sure. this is important, and this is probably more to national donors and national activists. Um, this is not only the last race of 2023, and, and look, go governors in Mississippi and Kentucky, but this is the first race of 2024. We have proven time again that we're kind of, we're the roadmap, you know, for what comes next year. Even more important um, that we we would like and appreciate to have the same kind of help that a Wisconsin got on the Supreme Court justices or Ohio gets on a referendum. I mean, this is it. This is it. And this will change the face of the Commonwealth of Virginia forever if we allow the mega Republicans to take over. Well, well, put James, do you agree that Susan and Ben Wickler are co-captains for state chairs? Uh, ab- absolutely, absolutely. And Susan's been a friend of mine forever, and she knows politics from the ground up, every aspect of it. And I, I feel very confident that she's our party chair. And these races are big. Let me tell you, in, in terms of 2024, the Democrats cannot win the presidency unless they carry Virginia. They just there's no other. Mm-hmm. You can't make right. a map mm-hmm. that. And it it's we have been bluer than places around us, but they're not so blue that we can take it for granted at all. I mean, must win. So, Susan right, Swicker, you are a fabulous guest. Thank you so much for being with us. You bet. Thank you all for having me on. Really appreciate it. This stuff is, I, 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 I come back and I, I, it's a twenty, it's a twenty four seven food. You know, it's great for breakfast, but it's great for watching games. It's great for when you're reading. Just pop some, and it it, it tastes good too. And I, I, you just don't see that combination of anything really out of fresh produce. Easy, easy. Right on. You know, we love the taste of delicious breakfast cereals growing up. And we bet you all did, too. That's why we're so glad they're back and even better with Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon tastes amazing and is much more wholesome and a high-quality option than what you remember. Have James and I been fans for a long time and our families can't get enough of it? Just ask my grandson, Kai. It's a race to pour a bowl before he gets any into the box. It just doesn't get any better when a company has created your favorite childhood cereals to taste amazing. Each serving has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and four to five net grams of carbs, with the honey nut having only one gram of sugar. Magic Spoon is proud to be keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, and soy-free to relive those moments watching your favorite cartoons. Plus, it's only 140 calories a serving. It's like there's magic in every spoonful. And with eight unique flavors, you're not going to get bored of feeling good with Magic Spoon. Now, my favorites are peanut butter mixed with cocoa, but my grandson Kai loves the blueberry muffin. There's many more for every taste. So check out the maple waffle, cookies and cream, and other flavors on their Dream Team roster to give your taste buds a treat. And we're excited to announce that super popular birthday cake is back. It's the previously limited edition only flavor now here to stay. So celebrate your birthday every day 
with this fan favorite. James, you got a birthday coming up soon, so you got to get some of that for your uh, for your birthday. <laughs> yeah, well, we're going to get Liam Campbell Carville Joel started on Magic Spoon here pretty soon. He's he's teething now. Poor little guy's having his little little go for it, but. Well, Magic Spoon is good for so much else. It may be good for teething, too. At least, you know, you can tell him to consult Kai Woodruff on, on that because he loves it. You and your family will love Magic Spoon as much as ours do. So head to magicspoon.com slash warroom to grab a custom bundle of cereal and try the magic for yourself. And be sure to use our promo code warroom at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product it's back with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it, for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash warroom and use the code warroom to save $5 off. Hey, thanks, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. Now, you also can find the link in our show notes. Hey, James, now for the outrage of the week. This one is too easy. The Texas State Senate Republicans acquitted Attorney General Ken Paxton after he was overwhelmingly impeached by the State House. Now, let's just do a brief review of the sleazy state of politics in the Lone Star State. Paxton has long faced state charges of security fraud. Almost three years ago, eight Top deputies. Now, these aren't some kind of lefties, but these are from the AG's own office, his own office. They reported him to the FBI for illicitly trying to protect the donor from an investigation and allegedly taking bribes. That donor, Austin real estate developer Nate Paul, is now under indictment. The, the evidence was powerful, as much of it was coming from Paxton's own staff. Now, in the Senate, the corrupt character of today's Texas politics was on display. As the Washington Post, Karen Tumley, a native Texan, noted, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, who was presiding over the trial, took $3 million from a pro-Paxton political action committee. He, he, he was the judge. Think maybe the fix was in? The religious right, a formidable force in Texas GOP politics, uh, along with Donald Trump, the religious right rallied behind Paxton, apparently delivering some of those Republican senators. The hypocrisy is stunning. Paxton, whose wife is a state senator, was having an affair with one of Nate Paul's employees, according to his aides, and using multiple cell phones and an alias to cover up the sordid affair. But now, Texas, I want you to feel good about your law enforcement. You got this guy, Ken Paxton, back in office as attorney general. Texas, I guess, deserves it, um, James, although most of the good people there don't. Yeah, I think he's still under federal investigation, too. Yeah. He's been indicted. I mean, it's you took that and you took Lauren Boebert. <laughs> and so uh, my outrage actually – Use two things from the New York Times op-ed page today. And of course, the modern Republican Party is that is non-existent. It's just it just comes out of a confederation of crazy right wingers. And Paul Krugman uh, did a good job and should read it. The road from Romney to MAGA. Economic conservatives tried to use extremists, but got used themselves. And how a lot of I don't know how many call them well-meaning Republican politicians thought if we just co-opted these people and we got our tax cuts and we humored them uh, that the world would advance. Bomb, bad bet turned out horribly. The inmates are now running the institution. But I want to focus a little bit more on a Michelle Goldberg column, who I've actually kind of come, uh, I've come to like more. And this one of these things that doesn't get a lot of attention. I don't know the meaning of it. I know the meaning is bad. All right. As we stumble forward toward an ugly extent of the election, panic is setting in among progressive groups because the donors buoyed them through the Trump years are disengaging. Donations to pressing organizations are way down in 1923 across the board. Now, these are groups that fund GOTV, 
they, they fund a lot of the organic stuff, and it's way down. You, you combine this with really tepid black turnout, and you combine this with unenthusiastic under 30 voters, and that's not good. I, that the fact that donations to these kind of grassroots GOTV organizations are, are, are way, way down, I, 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 I don't know how bad it is, but I do know this. It's another sign that this party is lethargic in the key people that have to vote in 2024 to stop this nation, to, to set, literally save the freaking Constitution. Because what you just saw in Austin is going to be the United States if Trump comes back in office. And I read, you know, read Paul's column. I thought it was very insightful. I thought Michelle's column was necessary, but at some level frightening. James, I agree with you on both those columns, and I thought that I, I, I was I was kind of the Goldberg column was an, was an eye opener. Um, do you have any theory as to why why that is down? People are doing they got there's lots of money out there. You know, I do have one, and they're just not enthusiastic about reelecting the president. I mean, I, I mean, I'm sorry. He's got the best record. That I don't think. I think it's inarguable that his record, these are the things that matter to Black America, is unparalleled. And not just the appointments, the un- unemployment, the, the differential in employment between whites and blacks, income growth, you name it. All right, you name it by by any standard. This has been an unbelievable president for black America, but yeah. maybe in ways, even President Obama, he didn't have the same symbolism, but I mean, his actual policies that he's put in have clearly been better. Uh, you know, clearly even, you know, President Clinton, who I worship, but there's no excitement out there. I, 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 and again, you, you, you see it in actual turnout numbers. Now you're seeing it in organic grassroots fundraising. The system is blinking red. Somebody pay attention. Yeah. We cannot, we can't go into this without robust black and and young turnout. And it's not happening right now. And, you know, for a long time, we just depended on Trump on the ballot. And I guess if he gets back on the ballot, maybe, maybe people get more activated. But right now, this is a lethargic political party, period. Oh, okay. Let's turn to our listener questions because they are so smart. And this is a follow of what you've been talking about, James. Another James in Lebanon, Kentucky, says President Biden is obviously dedicated to his family. Could you see him announcing his decision not to run in order to protect Hunter from the GOP persecution? What would be the political fallout of pardoning Hunter? Well, he has given zero indication that he's reconsidering running for re-election. That's pretty clear. Uh, I think if uh, in this whole Hunter Biden thing is a screwball deal, that that Weiss, that somebody screwed this original thing up. I think it was Weiss more than every low. And this is playing on the president. I mean, I don't have any doubt that that this is. I have no doubt that he's really worried about his son. He's had every kind of tragic involved. I respect that. Um uh, you know, of course, he could pardon him right now. I mean, numbers would go, they'd go, it would be very smart politically. Yeah, uh, but what, what they're putting this guy through is, I mean, he deserves some, you know, some some shame and some difficulty, but nothing like this. And, yeah. and this is just not not, not going to go away. It's part of life. No, I'm afraid you're right. And it's, I, I, I think... Um, for a whole lot of reasons, the president would have been 
in better shape if he had uh, decided to step aside as the most successful one-term president in the history of America. But in any event, um, James Shannon in Orange County, California, which used to be that hotbed of bed of right-wing Republicanism and now is uh, more Democratic. Right. Shannon has a very good question. Why are the Democrats and the media not talking more about the frightening Project 2025? Have you read it? It doesn't matter who the Republican nominee. This is their plan. It is their plan. It comes from Heritage and other right-wing places. It's basically to, you know, do away with, um, you know, a lot of civil service, to appoint uh, all kinds of right-wingers to post, to do things by executive and arbitrary actions that would dismantle parts of the federal government, to limit or to reduce a accountability. Uh, we think uh, it's, it's tailor-made for Donald Trump, but I think Shannon is right. I think it's something Democrats ought to highlight as much as they can. Of course we need to. In, you know, they're telling you what they're going to do. This is not, Trump is saying, I'm not going with these rhinos anymore. I'm going to appoint people. He's, it, we're going to have an entire government of Jeffrey Clark's. Understand that. Understand what's at stake. And Stephen the, Miller's. The freaking constitution of the United States is at stake. And, and I, 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 you know, about screaming to the top of my lungs at the, the danger that the United States faces. And it's a real freaking danger. And right now, this election would be held this November, and, and, and no labels in, in Cornell West were on the ballot. Trump would be a betting favorite, a betting favorite right now that the Constitution will be, what's left of it will be blown up. Mm -hmm. uh, I, that's what has stake here. You are so right. Sue in Cumberland, Rhode Island said, if voters live in fear of Kamala Harris becoming president, according to the polls, why does no one mention that Carrie Lake or Marjorie Taylor Greene could be potential running mates for Trump? That's far scarier. Well, of course it's far scarier. I mean, you can have whatever observations you want about the vice president, but she's hardly an anti-constitutionalist or crazy or, or, or any such thing as that. Uh, you know, but her her lack of popularity, I mean, you can't say that it's unfair to bring her up because people of, by nature, because of the president's age, are going to pay more, more and more attention to her. And but, but I, I think she's a, a patriotic person, Uh but she is having a little trouble finding her, her, her footing to inspire people. I, I saw, in, in if I just offered a observation, not so much criticism, but an observation, everything that they do is predictable. They're doing now are colleges with some emphasis on historically black college universities, but others talking about voting rights. That's great. But that's exactly what you think she would be doing. Uh, I would have preferred that she took up a much stronger anti-crime portfolio. And But for whatever reason, that, that, that wasn't in the cards. I think the administration kind of gave her a bum deal where they kind of put her in charge of the border, but really didn't do anything. And I think it was a she was doomed not to succeed in that mission. But... Uh, she's a good person. She's very credential, but right now she's having trouble getting her footing. Yeah, I agree. Um, Chris, in my hometown of Washington, D.C. Oh, my goodness. Chris lives inside the Beltway. Asked, please tell me what Schumer is doing as the leader of the Senate. Chris is not a fan. We waited so long uh, to be in the majority, albeit by one, but Schumer is nowhere, and the Senate Dems seem to be doing nothing with Tuberville, SCOTUS ethics, beginning a hearing on Jerry and Kushner and his wife. Chris, I disagree with you. Um, I think the problem is the Senate, not Schumer. I think Schumer's doing whatever he can. The Senate uh, is able to con itself into believing it's still the world's greatest deliberative body. That ended a long time ago. And they ought to do away with rules like one senator be able, being able to block nominations. What Tommy Tuberville 
is doing is betraying his country's national security. It is an outrage, and it just shouldn't be allowed. The Senate should change that rules. I'm sorry. Uh, it does not uh, make it for a more measured, a more careful body. It's not that. And I think that's what Schumer confronts. And I think uh, you'd like to do a lot more things. But, you know, when you got a 51-49 majority and you got rules that allow 40 people to block almost anything and a Republican Party that's determined to do that, I don't think Schumer can do a lot better than he's doing. You know, this is literally one of the most irresponsible things imaginable that he's doing. And I, the Tuberville's doing. The, the Tuberville's doing. It, it, I don't. I, I don't think we have been nearly as aggressive as we should be. I, I, I mean, it, it, it's not an issue that stokes up liberal donors, but it should. And we should be running TV ads. We should be talking about very little else. It, you, you, and this is so, it, it's really, I mean, people I really know, this is really hurting the national security in the United States. I, I guess the only thing positive out of this, I bet, when, when Al Gore ran against George Bush, I, I bet you he, Bush got 85% of flag officers in the United States military. Right. I, I bet you... In 2024, the Democrats get 85 percent, and they're not a lot of flag officers. But I think these guys have had enough of this stupidity. But this is a really bad deal, and they're not paying a big enough price for it. No, and the and voters no. would believe that Mitch McConnell could call him in and make him do that. What I'm also scared of is just another data point that says that that, that look how things are. Biden's not strong enough to deal with this. Oh, totally unfair. Totally unfair. But I, they, the calculation on the Republican side is any chaos is good for them. There's no such thing as bad chaos. And I, I, I'm afraid they're right. I am too. James, next, Arthur wants to know, if Kevin McCarthy cannot hold off his right-wing protagonist and essentially prevent the House from governing, why wouldn't Akeem Jeffries and the House Democrats want to form a coalition with a handful of sane Republicans to return order to the House? Okay, because there are no sane Republicans. They might be that they're more afraid than they are sane. So how is it that we have eight, you know, there was great hope on 18 Republicans that got elected in Biden districts. They're going along with this shit. They're going along with it because they will get primaried in their district. Listen to me, people. Sane Republicans are not going to save the United States. Only a robust turnout among Democrats in winning elections is going to save. They ain't riding to the rescue. And they're going to use McCarthy. I, 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 I mean, they just slap him around. He's totally at the mercy of them. And I don't, I, I, I don't know if people really want to save this country. It's, it's really stunning. But 18 of them, we all had great faith that, well, they were going to step in and they'd do something and they'd make a deal. I haven't seen any evidence of that yet. None. No, I haven't either. I wrote, as you know, about the timid 20 early on, and they, and they have remained timid. Uh, yeah. It'll be, it'll be tested in the next. I mean, I watched Nancy Mace on an interview with ABC, I guess, trying to defend the impeachment inquiry, and it was really, it was, it, you know, I, I cringed. It was. So. I, what is the impeachment? What is this inquiry? That's what I don't know the answer to. You covered the hell a lot. McCarthy coming out there and saying that, did that, did, did that change anything or mean anything? No, what it says is he doesn't have the votes to launch an impeachment inquiry because there's enough Republicans, enough of that Tim and 20 who knows how bad it would be. And the main, but there's no, nothing here. The main, the only purpose is to sleaze, uh, throw mud uh, on Biden, Hunter Biden, demagogue, and as you say, probably not hold public hearings. That's the only purpose of it. Uh, and, um, you know, I, so why I, I, didn't they said Pelosi never bought it to a vote for impeachment of Trump? 
Is that true? Right. That, that is true. That was in October of 2019. And McCarthy said that was absolutely unacceptable. The House is not allowed to do that. That's improper. Uh, and, of course, he's doing the same thing. There is a difference. There was a case to bring an impeachment uh, proceeding against Donald Trump. He shook down a foreign government in order to dig up dirt on a political opponent. I wish, you know, somebody, Kevin McCarthy or Jim, Jim Jordan, as you call him, G-Y-M Jordan, uh, or Nancy Mace or someone would tell us, what is the case against Joe Biden? They haven't told us, James, because you know why? There's not. Yes, you got it. You nailed it. You nailed it. Um, John, I, we're out of the beltway now, at least. John in Chicago says Senator Joe McCarthy, once censored by the Senate, saw his popularity diminish, yet he still had about a 30 percent support among his supporters. Do you see similarities between McCarthy and Trump as far as people who will support them? This pains me to say this, John. I wasn't around when Joe McCarthy was here, but I've read a, a marvelous book on Joe McCarthy by Larry Ty, Lawrence Ty. Uh, McCarthy, once he was censured, was really a spent force. It was all downhill. Uh, Trump uh, is far worse, and he is somehow uh, there is just um, he, you can't cut through it. His support is so solid that uh, uh, you know he he just I, I'm I'm afraid he is much more clever and much more durable and much more dangerous than Joe McCarthy. Yeah. Um, the only answer to this, honestly, you're not going to change your mind. Forget about it. The only answer is the Democratic Party needs to be enthusiastic. The key constituencies that make up the party, black voters primarily, but also younger voters, very, very critical. Uh, I, I, I'm very, very scared when I look at these turnout numbers, these fundraising numbers. But on the good side, I, I have to say, we haven't lost an election since Dobbs. Uh, I, I, think we, I think the Virginia legislative races are not just important for Virginia, but I think they're going to tell us something about 2024 in terms of turnout, enthusiasm, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. We, we shouldn't lose. I the agree. Way it's been going. James, our final question, and this is going to test my ability to pronounce this, but Tony in Huchenhausen, Germany. Huchenhausen, Germany, says, I've lived in three different German states for a total of 14 years. Man, this is a tough question. Why don't we Americans see what most Germans see? That our current state of affairs frighteningly mirrors mid-30s Germany. The only difference, Tony says, between the Trump sycophants and the German brown shirts is the color of their shirts. Wow. You know, just uh, uh, thank you. I, I, I took a, in 2019, I, American come, I took a Rhine River cruise. Man, I, the Rhine land is great. It's, it, that, that, that's a very, very colorful, I don't know what part of Germany uh, our writer is from. You know, people say you should never compare anything to Hitler. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, sometimes it, it's to see how these demagogues come up and to see what you're seeing. Maybe it's valid. And what I would invite our friend in Germany and I invite everybody who listens to the show and you, you know, it'll come right up if you just do triumph of the will. Oh, boy. Yeah. All right. It, it, you, it'll pull it up. Please watch the first 10 minutes. Please watch the first 10 minutes. I show it to all my clients. First of all, it's a tour de force in filmmaking. It's a tour de force in propaganda. <clears throat> and the similarities to what we see in today are eerie, are, are really, really eerie. And notice how she uses airplanes above the people. Notice the close-up to faces. Notice how many of these people are Nazis. Okay? You would be wrong to not use that as a lesson to what's going on today in American politics. 
Well, uh, James, I you just would not. You, 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 anybody watch that and they're going to come back and say, God damn, James, that was frightening. It is. Well, with your, you know, because of your advice, I've now started to show that every year to my University of Pennsylvania students. And you were right. It is a it's, it is one of the great propaganda films ever made, even though it was made uh, almost 90 right. years ago. Uh, it's still one of the great propaganda films ever made. And it is frightening to watch. Yeah, and, and while I'm here as a cradle Catholic and still follow, the, 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 it's the end of Pius XII. I never liked that son of a bitch anyway. And this letter they found, a German Jesuit telling him they were killing 6,000 people a day. Uh, thank God this, this argument is now behind us. He, he, he was Hitler's pope. Yeah, he sure was. All right. Thank you, everybody. Keep those questions coming. We love them. We didn't get to them this week. We'll get to them next week. Hey, thanks for listening to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. Don't forget to send your questions for us by email to politicswarroom at gmail.com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon. Following this episode, we'd really appreciate it if you check out the links to our sponsors, Henson Shaving, Miracle Made, and Magic Spoon in our episode show notes. We thank you for supporting them because when you do, you help make this podcast happen. Now, to keep up with us, subscribe to Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. You also can find other shows you might enjoy on the Politicon YouTube channel or when you search Politicon on your favorite podcast sites. Remember, please rate the show with a five-star review. We'll be back next week with another show as we continue our War Room planning.